Okay, let's continue. In the previous example, we began by looking at the definition of a context-free grammar and the definition of Chomsky normal form. We then began to write a program in the scale of programming language to read a context-free grammar from disk. To do that, we began by defining a set of classes, including a parent trait called symbol and three things that extended symbol. A singleton object called epsilon, a class called terminal, and a class called non-terminal. We also have an object called myProgram that implements a main method which runs the program. If we run the program right now, all it does is create an instance of a single non-terminal NP and then prints that. In doing so, it calls the toString method of the symbol of the trait symbol, returning the underlying value that is stored in the non-terminal NP. Next, we're going to extend this by adding another class called rule. We're then going to add a grammar class and some helper functions that read the context-free grammar from disk. Ultimately, once we do all of that, in the next part, we will hopefully get to uh, starting to convert an arbitrary context-free grammar into Chomsky normal form. All right, so let's create a new class called rule. This will be a context-free rule. Now, the previous classes extended symbol, but rule wouldn't be appropriate to extend symbol. So what does a context-free rule contain? Well, to begin with, it has a left-hand side that is a non-terminal. We're going to store that as a member variable, a member value in the class. A rule also has a sequence of symbols on the right hand side. That sequence can be zero or more symbols and that would be the right hand side. So we'll create a new member variable, new member value called right hand side and the type is going to be a sequence of symbols. Sequence is a built-in type in Scala. All right, so we've got a rule that consists of a left-hand side that is a non-terminal and a right-hand side that is a sequence of symbols. What else might we want to do with a rule? Well, one thing, we might want to print it. So let's create a two-string method. Note that rule implicitly inherits from a set of default uh, classes uh, that go up to object. I believe object is the right one in Java, and I think Scala does the same thing. You can check classes. Finding a class. So we want the API documentation for Scala. Find the types. And in Scala, we've got the abstract class any uh, in which two string is defined. Because that's defined elsewhere, we have to override it as discussed previously. Okay, so we're going to return a string. What do we want to return? We want to return the left-hand side and then an arrow and then the values on the right-hand side. Okay, so in Scala we can do something called string interpolation. Most programming languages have something like string interpolation, but the syntax varies. In Scala, to, to signal string interpolation, we prefix the string literal with an S. 
And then in so doing, we can wrap uh, a section of the interior of the string and then put arbitrary code inside here. So this looks a little bit like uh, string interpolation in Bash. All right, so here we've got left-hand side and let's get an actual arrow symbol. Okay, and then string interpolation again. And here we want the right-hand side. So right-hand side and we're going to make string with the separator spaces in between, okay? So all of this is an arbitrary call to scale a code. So we're calling the make string method on the sequence right-hand side, uh, and the make string is going to display all of the elements, okay? If we hover over here in the IDE, we get the documentation for that method. So this is going to display all of the elements of this sequence in a string, uh, concatenating them together with the separator string, which I've provided here, space. Okay. All right. So that's going to give us a nice, pretty uh, two-string method. Okay. All right. So now we could create uh, a rule. So let's go back down to our main and we'll say that's the left hand side and we'll create uh, a new right hand side that's going to be a sequence consisting of currently epsilon So we're creating a left-hand side that is a non-terminal NP and a right-hand side that is the sequence uh, consisting of epsilon. And if we run it, then we get this printed out very nicely down here. NP goes to epsilon. Okay. All right. So next, let's try reading from a grammar. Okay, so here is the sample grammar that we came up with previously. We've got S goes to NPVP, S goes to Epsilon, NP goes to DTN, VP goes to V, DT goes to the, DT goes to A, N goes to boy, V goes to walks. All right, so now we have to figure out where we're going to put uh, the code that is going to read from a file, okay? So let's wrap this uh, for the moment in a singleton object called grammar, okay? And we'll call this uh, method called read rule, okay? So let's assume that we have a single line of code, or uh, sorry, rather a single line from that file that is a string. And given that, we want to return a rule. Okay. All right, so this will let us process one line at a time. So if we've got a line of this form, the first thing is gonna be the left-hand side, and then anything else is gonna be the right-hand side. So we could split this on white space. So we could take this string that represents a line and split it on white space, okay? So if we don't know how to do that, we can get online and figure it out. Scala split string on white space. Stack overflow is often a good place. And turns out there's a split function, and looks like the split can take a string literal or even a regular expression. So this is exactly what we want. So we will say the first thing we're going to do is create
create a new value called parts that is going to be created by taking line and splitting on the regular expression one or more white space characters. So the first thing we're doing here is escaping the backslash character and then backslash s is representing white space in a regular expression notation and plus means one or more. Okay. All right. So this is going to get us the result. If we ho hover over here, we see that parts is now an array of strings. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be a Java array. Uh, just for sanity's sake, let's go ahead and convert that to a list so that we'll be working with a Scala object rather than a Java array. Okay. All right. So now we've got a list of strings. Okay. The first string in this array, or in this list, is going to be the left-hand side. So the string for the left-hand side is going to be parts sub-zero. Okay? Note that in Scala, to index, we're going to use the apply method, which looks like indexing with uh, parentheses rather than with square brackets. So in many other languages, we would use square brackets like this. In Scala, we're going to do this. All right. So next, we need the string corresponding to the right-hand side. So we want parts, and we want to slice it. Okay. So slice is a general purpose operation in lots of programming languages, and Scala has, makes it available. So it's, we're going to slice from uh, position 1 to the end, parts.size. Okay, so this will give us from one to the end. Okay, all right, and that'll give us a list on the right-hand side. Now, we might want to handle the special, a special case here, and that special case is what happens if the right-hand side list is empty. Okay, so one question is, what would slice return? So it'll return a list containing the elements greater than or equal to the index from extending to. So let's give it a try. Let's open up a terminal. Uh, and fire up the Scala interactive prompt. And create a new list. Okay, and then we can run the slice operation from 1 up to x dot size. Makes sense, that's what we wanted. But now let's try a different list that doesn't have right hand side and see what happens when we run slice. Okay, we get an empty list. So it doesn't give us an error, just gives us an empty list. Okay, so okay. All right. Seems like I lost something here. Hmm. All right, well, we might have to add our main back in. Seems like we lost it. That's okay, we can do that. All right, so. What do we do if right-hand side is empty? 
if right hand side string is empty, it's if it's an empty list, then we want uh, the symbol to actually be epsilon. Okay, so if the right hand side, that's not going to be a string, that's going to be a list, or we could say right hand side strings, plural. Right hand string strings dot is empty. Then things are easy. We're going to create a new rule consisting of a new non terminal with the left hand side string. And the right hand side is going to be. Uh, epsilon, or rather the sequence containing epsilon. Okay. Another way of writing that, instead of putting it all in one line, would be to say I'm creating a new val called left hand side that is a new non terminal with the left hand side string, and right hand side is going to be a sequence called epsilon, and then left hand side, right hand side. Okay. Now we need an else. And then down here we need to handle the case of, well, what happens if it's not null? Okay. All right. So there's a couple of options available to us here. So one is going to be the traditional way that we would handle this in a language like Python, uh, where we kind of go about things imperatively, uh, step by step. But uh, as I mentioned in one of the previous uh, lectures, Scala is a multi-paradigm language, which means that in addition to object-oriented programming, Scala also allows us to program in a functional style, uh, the way that you would if you were programming in Lisp or Haskell um, or ML. So I'm going to show a little bit of this. This is not going to be the way you would do it in Python, and we may go back and go through the way you would do it in Python or a language like that that doesn't have this functional style available to you. Uh, but this is one of the nice things that's available uh, in a language like Scala. Okay, so conceptually, what's going on here? Well, this part we can move out because this is going to be common to both the if and the else. Okay, But the right hand side is going to differ. So we want to define a new right hand side and how do we come up with it? Well, we're going to start with right hand side strings. And what's the type of right hand side strings? The type is a sequence of strings. Okay, Let's double check. Slice returns a list of strings, so a sequence, a list is a sequence, but I could say list of strings. Okay, so we could start with right hand side strings. And then what do we need to do? Well, for each of those strings, we need to create a new object. We need to create either a terminal object or a, or a non terminal object. Okay. And so to do this, we're going to use a method called map. Okay, look at, now look at the type. Map says that it is going to have this complicated uh, type here in its parameter. So the way to read this is that map takes as its parameter something called f, and f is itself a function. So f is a function that takes parameter a and returns, uh, that takes a parameter of type a and returns a value of type b, okay? And the map function is going to build a new collection. So it's going to take the collection that's, that we started with, which is a list of strings, and build a new collection by applying the function f to every element in the original collection. So we're going to take every element in this collection, 
Now that's going to be the strings that represent the right hand side. And for each string, we're going to call this function. And the result is going to be a new collection that is of the type whatever b is. Okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to have our function be something that takes a string and returns a symbol. Okay? And uh, we could do that literally if we wanted to. So we could say val f, or rather def f, or val f uh, equals a right hand side string. And it's going to return something like epsilon. That's not actually what we want to return, but let's check the syntax and see if this works. Okay, it is. So the type of f is an anonymous function that takes a string and returns epsilon. Great, this is starting to look what we like what we want. Okay, all right, so this notation where we have the curly braces and then have something on the left and then this equals arrow and then something on the right, this whole thing is a function. This is the parameters to the function. This is the body of the function. Okay, And implicitly, the last thing in the function is going to be what's returned. Okay. All right, so we don't actually want to return epsilon. What do we want to return? Well, first we need to check to see if it's a terminal or a non-terminal. Now, by convention, non-terminals start with uppercase letters and terminals start with lowercase letters. This is just a convention that we use in English. If we were parsing German, we would have to think of some other convention but we're going to deal, do this as our convention for now. So if the right-hand side string, and we want, if the character at index 0, so if this is the first letter, dot is upper, so if the character at, if the zeroth character, so if the first character is uppercase, then we've got a terminal, or sorry, a non-terminal, and we can return a new non-terminal constructed from the right-hand string. Sorry, there we go. Okay, now why is it complaining? Well, because we wanted to return a rule. This function that we're dealing with returns a rule. Now, this is a little bit frustrating to somebody coming uh, new to Scala that this anonymous function can't have, the, can't have the keyword return. Instead, we're just going to have this. Now, what's really going on there will be clear in a moment, and I'll go ahead and put this in and then explain what's going on here. Okay. Okay, now the way to read this block is as follows. This block is a function. This is the parameter to the function. Everything from the end of the arrow to the closing bracket is the body. I'm defining a value, so this is immutable. On the right hand side of the equal sign is an if then, uh, an if if else. This might be a little weird to you or not, depending on what language you've come from, 
but in Scala, an if else is going to return a value. If you're used to C, a language like C, uh, this is going to look an awful lot like what's going on in a ternary operator this, with a C style ternary operator. Um, so if this is true, then the result of the statement is this. Otherwise, the result of the statement is this, which means that the right hand symbol is going to be either a non terminal or a terminal. And the compiler is smart enough to figure out that that means it must be a symbol. We could explicitly put that here if we want to. Okay, so the right hand side is a symbol. And now we're going to put as the last statement in the block the right hand side symbol itself, okay, which is an implicit return. So it, that whatever in, in this style of a block that is a function, whatever the last statement is, is going to be the implicit return value of that block, okay? Now this means that we could have alternatively just done this. I'm going to comment out this line and I'm going to comment out this line. Now the if else is the last statement and the code that I have right here is completely equivalent to what I just had before I commented it out. And Scala programmers would probably prefer this rather than what I had there. Okay. All right. So now we've got this function. So we could put the return type if we wanted to. It's a string. It, it's a function that takes a string and returns a symbol. Okay, so now we can go back to map. So recall that map will take f as its parameter. Okay, and what does it return? What's well, the type of right hand side? It's going to be a list of symbols, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, all right, so that's map. Now, We've gone through this way to show explicitly what's going on. Now I'm going to show you what you would be more likely to actually see in practice. So in code written by someone familiar with Scala, it is quite likely that instead of creating this explicit value f and putting it here and then putting f in here, what often would be done is put this entire block of code inside the parameter right there. Okay, so let's do that. So instead of f, we can explicitly put the literal of this function right here. Okay. You can even omit the parentheses so that it looks like this. And then you've got something that looks much more like what's going on in Ruby with this style of programming in map in Ruby, which Ruby does allow. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this. Okay, so the right hand, right hand side is a list of symbols. Okay. Now we could even do something like this and take this idea of an if else having a value and go for it here. So we could say right hand side equals Okay. Now, if this block, then the result of the if will be this new rule that then gets stored over here in the right hand side. Sorry, we don't want the new rule yet. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so if the right hand side is empty, then we'll have a sequence of epsilons. Otherwise, we will have a list of symbols. Okay, 
So now the type of right hand side is a sequence of symbols, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, so what's going on here? Right hand side is either going to be the body of this if statement, which is a sequence containing epsilon, or the body of this, which is going to be a list of strings that gets mapped to this, resulting in a list of symbols. Okay, so this is much. This is a lot, probably what you would see in regular Scala code. Okay, and we can clean that up, leave white space or not. Here's the end of the else block down here. And now we have a left hand side and a right hand side. And so we can return a new rule consisting of the left hand side and the right hand side. Now, if we were in a language that didn't have this sort of map function, we could have just iterated, created a new collection, a new list. So if we were in Python, what we could have done would have been created a new list called result equals a new, a new list in Python, and then added, iterated over each element in right-hand side strings and then added a new non-terminal or terminal to that list uh, and then returned the result. Okay. Which you prefer is largely a matter of taste and programming style. Uh, okay. All right, so now we've got a rule. So that now we have something that reads a rule, takes a string and returns a rule, okay? All right. Okay, so I just folded up that code. It's still there, but the development environment that I'm in allows me to hide it for right now. Okay. All right, so then now the next thing we want to do is read all of the rules. So let's create another function called read rules plural that takes a file name that is a string and returns an iterable over rules. So something that we can iterate over. Okay. All right, so how do we read a file in, in Scala? read from file in okay all right so it looks like we're going to have to import uh, okay now, Scala lets us import within the body of a, of a function, or we can import as we would in Python at the top of the file. Import. Okay, so that's how you would import uh, something in Java or Python. If we only want it visible within the context of the function that we're in, we can actually do the import statement right there, and then we'll still have it act, still have access to it. Um, so now we're going to say source dot read oops, from path file name. Okay. And that's going to get us what? A source object. So that'll be val file. Okay. And that's not liking that. What didn't it like? From path is not a member of scala.io.source. Let's try something else. Scala.io.source from file. Let's try from file. That's better. Okay. And the type is a buffered source. Okay. And the buffered source is capable of uh, 
getting its getting the getting the lines. Okay, so if you want to say lines equals this dot get lines, get lines is going to return an iterator over strings. Okay, which we could put inside a for loop and notice that Scala does have a for each loop. Um, but I'm again going to do uh, a more functional style to uh, illustrate that. Okay. So lines is going to be an iterator over strings. Okay. So I'm going to say lines dot map. Recall what we did with uh, the functional style over here. We used map that took a function literal and did something with it. We're going to do the same sort of thing here. Okay, so remember that inside here is going to be a function literal, uh, which we could, if we wanted to, define up here. Val f equals something. Here I'm skipping this step and going straight to here. And so the thing that this function takes is going to be a line that is a string and we're going to return something, and the something that we're going to return is a rule. Okay. Now this is going to be super easy because we've already defined how to read a rule down here in this function. It takes a line, returns a rule, so what we can do right here is just call read rule online. Okay. And now lines.map is going to uh, Val result equals lines.map. Okay, and result is an iterator over rules. So let's change this from iterable to iterator. Turn result. Okay. So that's all we need to be able to read the rules. All right. So now let's go down to our main. Maybe. There we go. All right. So args is going to be the file that the user provides. Okay. So first, let's test to see if the user provided anything args.length equals zero then let's print a statement the user must provide a text file as an argument okay otherwise File name is going to be args sub zero, and then we're going to call grammar.readRules. This time we'll go ahead and use the other the for each style loop just to show you how it looks in Scala. So for rule in grammar dot read line read rules. Uh, file name, print the rule. Okay, and let's specify that in the configuration that the argument is going to be sample grammar dot text, which is in the same folder that we're working in. If we run it, then we see at the console that it worked. That we read everything. So here was our grammar file. We read it in, read each into a rule, and then printed it out. Okay, so that's all for this time. We'll pick up there next time.